Okay, welcome into another duly noted podcast. We appreciate everybody for watching. If you're watching us live, as you can on Facebook and YouTube, or if you're listening to us uh, on any of the 39 platforms we're on, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, and WRUF, which was where I posted my back nine at 9.30 this morning. How about that? I was ready to go. I had a lot of things to say about what's going on in college football. Again, we are coming to you presented by ABC Fine Wine and Spirits and Titan MRI. We appreciate their support. Still have a couple of spots left if you want to get in. We're kind of waiting on, on some people as far as being sponsors of this podcast. And um, we're hoping one that we can increase it to three times a week if we get enough people involved in it. Uh, but we've gotten great feedback, and uh, the numbers look pretty good, and, uh, you know, that's the way it works. Anyway we got two great guests for you today. Peter Burns is going to join us in just a little bit. And then later on in the show at the bottom of the hour, Patrick Young, who is just back from Greece where he was uh, he was kind of in his own version of lockdown because he was hurt and he couldn't really play for the team over there. And finally, he has decided to come home. Uh, he's doing some wonderful things in this area, uh, which he scares him. He's coming for all my jobs, and i got a lot of them. All right, uh, let's start out by talking about how bowl season just seemed to fly by. I mean, um, you know, and again, we know why it did, because it started right away. It was like, I think there was a bowl game played on the day of the, the conference championship games. But no, seriously, it, it just flew by, and it's over, and all we got is the one game left, and I, it might be a great one. It might be a stinker. Uh, if it was a semifinal, we know it would be a stinker. And I don't know what the answer to that is, why all the semifinals end up being stinker. But more than that in, the more, in a minute. The thing that's, uh, that is driving you crazy a little bit is how fast the season went by. Because the bowl season, because, and I love bowl, bowl games. People that complain, there's too many bowls. Well, don't watch them. Nobody's making you watch them. I, I like bowl games, and I watch most of them, you know, parts of them. But it just felt like they were, they were, they went by so fast. There weren't many of them. That was part of the problem. And the other problem is the season ended so late. So it's like, bowl season's over. What? We just got started with it, didn't we? Um, and, of course, you know the records. They've been well advertised. The SEC went 6-2, and two, which is not bad. And we'll talk to Peter about that. The Big, the Big 12 went 5-0. and oh. They had some good matchups. Big 10, 3-1. and one. Pac-12, 0-2. Oh and, <laughs> and the ACC, 0-6. Oh and that, you know, again, you got two teams in the playoff, in the playoff, and you still go 0-6. Uh, that certainly doesn't look good. Miami lost a, a tough game, and I know that, they, you know, they had some teams that matchups weren't great. But here's the thing. I don't worry about these bowl records. I pass them along to you. That's all I'm doing. What you did in the bowls has nothing to do with how good your conference was because it all depends on two things. One, what your matchup is. Because some matchups just aren't good. Like, you could have a team that was as almost the same caliber, but that was a bad matchup. Or you could have a team that was a, a you know, an even better team, but they matched up. You matched up really well with them. You did the things well that they didn't do. You know, you don't, never know where, where that's going to go. That's the A part of that. And the B part, obviously, is the opt-outs. Um, I don't know if there's an answer to all that. We talked about that with Coach Spurrier last week. Um, you know, about the, you know, going to, he wants to go to 16 team playoff. Well, maybe that works. Maybe it doesn't. Right now, we, all we know is um, in a COVID year, it, it was really, it almost seemed like it was blasted in our face how bad the bowl system did not work. And again, we get for the, for the, I, every year in a row, I should say, um, 20 point margin is the average in the semifinals that we've had since the college football playoff began. That's unbelievable. If you've got a question for me, you want to get in at any point, just be sure you call the, uh, the hotline at 352-780-0720. That is the text line, I should say. And uh, if you have got to want to get questions in on Facebook Live, we'll also answer those. So. Here's a story that captivated my weekend, even though it wasn't really a story. And that was the situation with Dan Mullen. And, and again, I'm not reading all the stories, 
uh, I'm not reading all the websites or, or, or all the time. I'm, but it seems like there were a lot of people down on on um, Coach Mullen. You know, and again, I get it. I get why you're upset. Um, you didn't like the way your team. You're, it was embarrassing what Florida put on the field Saturday or what was that last Wednesday night? Again, that's that goes. That's part of the fact that this season went by so fast. This bowl season, because it was all of a sudden one day you woke up and went, "I think Florida's playing in two days." I, I, you know, it was just weird. But nobody liked that. Nobody liked some of the things that happened this year. But where were you before Dan Mullen came into town, guys? I mean, we let's not forget what it was like around here with no offense, no quarterback play, and you were almost irrelevant with the exception of getting to the uh, conference championship game after you lost FSU every year, which was really bad. Um, in fact, in, in my back nine, I had a list of uh, the four – teams that actually had winning records and lost their last three games. you got to go there and read it. I'm making, I'm making you do that. Um, so you had this situation with Dan Mullen where on the, on the one hand you got people going, you know, I'm sick of Dan Mullen. I want to get, get rid of him. And again, I'm, I know this is a lunatic fringe. I, used to, I like to call them giddiots, gator idiots, people that want Dan Mullen out of here. And you, on the other hand, you have a group of people saying, Oh, he can't go to the Jets. Please don't go to the Jets. I'm not sure either one is a story. Now, I saw Matt Hayes, who uh, we'll get on the show here somewhere down the line, good friend of mine, wrote about uh, how he feels like there's a, a weird pause over at Florida that nobody's saying much, and, and uh, they haven't given him an extension for the second year in a row. And, you know, it just keeps going on and on. And I, I keep saying, well, what are they supposed to do? Come out and go, rah, rah, rah. They could do what Texas did and say, we love our coach. We're going to keep him here forever. And then fire him, which, which is another thing that happens. So we're going to talk about all that. But right now, we're going to bring in our first guest. It's a great pleasure to bring in the great Peter Burns, the man. See, the difference between me and Peter is I've got stories I've written up on my wall. He's got flags up on where on his wall because he's actually played some of these courses and actually probably played well on them. Peter, how are you? What's going on, Pat? Yeah, it's um, you know, back back in the days when I could play golf before the two kids and before this pandemic. So, uh, we're getting closer and closer every single day, but yeah, it's it's kind of interesting what you were talking about. I mean, we we discussed it a lot this morning about uh, what's going on with uh, you know, Dan and just kind of the crazy off season that already started just what days uh, days since the bowl season that kind of ended for most people. Yeah, it is it's just kind of weird that um it's almost like everybody's forgotten. But, but again, Gator fans are spoiled. They were spoiled. They were raised on Spurrier, and they were, you know. And then all of a sudden, you had the Urban Meyer and the Tim, which they called the Tim Tebow years. They don't refer mm -hmm. to them as the Urban Meyer years, but the Tim Tebow years. And so they're a little spoiled. And when, again, when you go out and lay an egg like you did on uh, last Wednesday, that's going to be a negative. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody kind of recalibrates at that point, right? At the end of the bowl season, you're going to talk about how many teams are truly going to be happy of, of what goes down. And it wasn't just a loss. It was the way that that, that Florida lost and to Oklahoma. But, you know, I, I looked at it going in that I didn't necessarily expect Florida to win that game. But, again, you want those teams to be competitive. And I actually said on my show this morning, Pat, that I felt like Florida's loss – and the way they lost to Oklahoma actually helped the rest of the SEC the rest of the bowl season. Because I kind of figured, like, hey, once you saw that, I think every single coaching staff said, hey, listen, everybody's got a, an axe to grind against what arguably we think is the best conference in all of college football. You, you, you don't want that to happen to your team. And I think that led to ultimately some of the success. And I know it, you know, I talked to Doring about it this morning. You know, Chris Doring is not necessarily the happiest camper how things ended, much like most Gator fans. You know, the question is, is what's the right fit um, in Florida? And I don't think there's a doubt that Dan has been the right fit for where you want this program to go, especially offensively. It's a matter of, hey, is he the, is he the right fit for the long term? Or is, you know, is he already kind of looking at going in a different direction if the NFL team comes calling? You know, there are a lot of people out there who just want somebody else. 
You know, like they don't know who they want. They just want somebody else at quarterback. They want somebody else at right guard. They want somebody else at coach. And uh, it, it's, believe me, I have to deal with it a lot down here. But, but you hit a point right on the head that I've been trying to make to people is that you got to understand you're the best conference, right? There's not much doubt mm-hmm. about that. The SEC is the best conference. Everybody's going to give you their best shot. And if you don't realize that, you know, no, no, nobody's saying, boy, I, I can't wait to play uh, Michigan State. I'm, we're going to give them our best shot or, or anybody like that. But, but in the SEC, you have to have that mentality that everybody's Super Bowl is when they play you. Right. And I think, uh, again, I think that's what happens as heavy as the head that wears the crown. And that's part of what happens with the with this team is that everybody will circle, especially in a year where motivation is a little bit different on bowl games. Everybody's going to circle the SEC is like, man, I can't wait to play them. And I think that's what happened with Florida going forward. Um, and and, I, and again, I look at this and I'll be like, all right, what do we what what's this Florida Gators team going to look like next year? I would assume Georgia's going to look pretty darn good. But other than that, is anybody really pushing the, the Florida and Georgia in the East? And I don't really see it. South Carolina is making a coaching change. You know, I like what Eli Drinkwitz is doing over at Missouri, but I'm not sure if they're ready to take that next step into, you know, the air that Florida and, and Georgia was breathing. Um, and I don't see Tennessee making a quick change. So, again, it's still a one-two horse in the East. And, hell, you're, you know, if you don't falter against LSU, you're one step away from a college football playoff uh, opportunity. So if you would have told Gator fans back in the day, hey, your offense is going to be incredible. You're going to have a Heisman Trophy type quarter or quarterback. Um, you're going to have a bunch of draft picks go. Would you be happy where this, this team is? Absolutely, you'd be happy. So I think I think it's a matter of the framework. And sometimes you can't sometimes fans and, and a lot of times boosters can't see the forest through the trees. Yeah, and a lot of it too, and you, you see this with every fan base, Peter. I know you've been around and you've seen it all, and of course you, you know the LSU fan base, but you have the squeaky wheels. You know, the squeaky wheels are going are gonna to get the you know, most attention, and those are the mm-hmm. people that tend to get the most upset. Uh, but, you know, then now everybody says, well, maybe he's going to the Jets, and everybody goes, no, 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 we don't want that to happen. I mean, you can't have it both ways. Well, and, and so, I mean, again, I think you're right. And I will say this, boosters have become more and more important than ever. And, and I don't mean important to uh, like us as fans, but what I mean is that they have an incredible amount of leverage, Pat. I mean, think about it. Yeah. When you look at every single athletic department right now, they are hemorrhaging money because of the way the season was played. And when people were saying, oh, there, there won't be any coaching changes and they won't do that at Vandy or won't do it at South Carolina or other places, I said, well, wait a minute. The boosters are going to have even more say at Auburn and other places like that because now when you're not making the money you used to, guess what? In order to keep the pay the bills and everything keep afloat, you're going to have to rely on those boosters, and those boosters are going to want something in exchange. So, again, I I think a lot of times there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, but then I start thinking about it. I'm like, if Dan isn't in Gainesville, who in the world is going to do the job that Dan Mullen, I think, can do in Gainesville? And there's not a lot of names that, that frankly, come to mind, Pat. I mean – this is, this is a great job, but it's very unique, and I think Dan fits the uniqueness that's great for the Florida Gators. Yeah, and that's the thing. You never, I mean, look, there's only one Alabama, and right now they're, they've got the roost. And, you know, we've seen other teams in the side. Obviously, LSU last year, Texas A&M this year, uh, kind of come up and challenge, but fall back. And, and in the East, Florida finally gets over a hump that they, they needed to get over, and still people are upset. Uh, you mentioned that that in the uh, you know the, the all the coaching changes that have been made, I'm amazed that none of us were smart enough to see that was what was going to happen. Instead of the very opposite, I mean, we all everybody was saying nobody's going to get rid of their coach, not with the mm-hmm. the money that everybody's going to be losing. Instead, what we didn't realize, I think, Peter, was that the bottom line is those boosters are still the ones writing the checks. And when they quit writing the checks, that's like losing money. Well, again, yeah, when you have when you don't have the leverage or the boosters did not have the leverage that they have coming out of this pandemic beforehand, it was, hey, listen, you know, Auburn's going to have 75,000 plus in the stadium. They're going to get six home games, all the concessions, everything they're going to sell. They've got money that they can handle the way that they want. Well, all of a sudden that goes away. Who are you going to turn to? You're going to turn to the boosters and the boosters are going to say, well, here's what I want in exchange of continuing to cut that check. 
because and, and, and they don't have to cut that check. And but boosters are a lot of the lifeblood, especially when you start talking about the facilities, you know, and Florida's in the situation of trying to build up and get their new facilities going right. and up to the same par as everyone else right now. And the last thing you want to do is upset those boosters that aren't going to be a part of that funding when, hey, by the way, you're not getting 80,000 in the swamp or you're not getting people over there and, and to watch Mike White's basketball squad um, or even the new baseball stadium as much as you'd like to. So it is it is just a weird, weird year. And, uh, you know, I, I do think that ultimately you're going to come down for Gator fans and think about it going, well, what would be next? There is no next. You know, I mean, Sarkeesian is a very interesting name, but now it's Sark going to Texas. It's like, where is that next head coach out there? And I don't I don't know that there is a next head coach out there that is that is just an absolute slam dunk for any program, not even just in case Florida loses uh, Dan Mullen to the NFL. Yeah, you know, one thing I will, I will say to Texas, be, don't fall in love with Alabama's offense because Alabama's offense is that way because of Alabama's players. I mean, there is nobody mm -hmm. like Devontae Smith out there. You know, Mac Jones is having a great year, and, and you know, I, I, I give him a lot of credit. But uh, when you think about what he, what he and Tua had to throw to last year, four other wide receivers that are first-rounders, plus Jalen Waddell, and then they lose Jalen Waddell, and they go, ah, oh, we'll put another guy in there. I mean, that's why their offense works. It's because they've just got such great players. And another reason why it works, too, is that that, that team that we're seeing in Alabama was – was 10 years in the making. What I mean by that is that when Saban got there, Pat, as you well know, hey, he he, it was a huge uh, deal for Mal Moore to grab Saban, right? Saban had already turned him down, says, hey, I'm not going to take this job. And he says, I'm not leaving here without you. And so he ends up hiring him. And from that point on, it was, all right, Saban's going to be here, but he needs to work with his athletic director and all the boosters need to take a back seat because this is how this program is going to be run. There's, there's very few coaches that can do that. But what it did was it provided an unbelievable pipeline for all these recruits to come in. It, all these, you know, the, to, for him to set up his kind of NFL team here on the college level, he did that nine, 10 years ago at, down in Tuscaloosa. And now they continue to reap the rewards every single year, including grabbing a bunch of good hire and a bunch of former head coaches that end up working for him. You know, uh, somebody told me this, this the, other, the other night, and it's pretty interesting, and I thought it was that the best recruiter at Alabama is Nick Saban, and that Nick Saban recruits more, uh, more than most head coaches. He actually will call four different players every night on the phone and see how they're doing and call, just personally call. Now, Nick Saban is the biggest deal in football, and for him to do stuff like that, he knows he's going to lose all his assistants. So why right. let them get it, have these personal relationships? He takes over the personal relationship. And he's, and he's adapted from that. That's not something that he would always do. But then at that point, he realized, hey, listen, if I'm going to keep losing this guy, I, I, I can't. I got to be part of the, the recruiting process as well. And the other part of uh, it, it, too, Pat, where Nick Saban is an under, under heralded recruiter is not necessarily 17 and 8 year old kid, 18 year old kids. It is the 20 year old Devonta Smiths and the Najee Harris's and those guys to say, hey, listen, right now you can go into the draft and you'll be a second round pick or you'll be a late first round pick. But you know how much money you'll get if you're the fifth pick of the draft? That's about $15, $15 million more. Come back. And Saban's job of re-recruiting players to come back to Alabama when it makes sense is arguably the biggest, um, you know, the, the biggest recruiting thing that nobody ever talks about because we're also talking about five stars and four stars right. and this kid out of high school and whatnot. It's actually the guys that decide to come back and, and up their draft stock. It's, I think, that's uh, probably the best job he does. I mean, this Alabama team, if they win this game against Ohio State, you know, where will they go in the pantheon of great Alabama teams? I mean, there have been so many great ones. And, I mean, you, it's so hard to compare the teams that Bear Bryant had running the wishbone with these teams. Now, they're, they're, it's like I heard Michael Jordan say, you know, Tiger Woods never played against Jack Nicklaus. So you can't, how do you compare them? In the same way, yeah. I don't know how you compare, but this certainly seems like one of the great teams of all time. 
Well, and not only just as far as you look at the stats, but the thing that they had to go play 11 SEC games, right? A 10-game right. SEC schedule plus an SEC championship game, then get by possibly Notre Dame and Ohio State, two great brands. But maybe most importantly, to do it in this pandemic, right? I mean, to do it in a year that you didn't have spring ball, you, you had to, you didn't have your traditional practice schedule set up. You could lose a player at any single time. In fact, you lose coaches at any single time. So the, you know, normally the calendar is set so so regimented for all co college coaches that you know what's going to happen. Literally, it was a day-to-day -day situation for Alabama to maintain excellence, and they never blinked, not once. You know, at least up to this point, um, Florida gave them a good run for their money. But even the SEC championship game, Pat, it never really felt like. Florida was about to steal that win. It looked like Alabama still was going to, to win that game. Um, and so to me, if they're able to beat Ohio State handedly, I know we're going to be prisoners of the moment, but you would say it's it's every bit what LSU did last year. The reason why we just – like everyone talked about LSU is that traditionally offensively they, were, they weren't great. And we just saw this explosion and we were so surprised with it. Um, I think we'll look at this Alabama team arguably as one of the best that Nick has ever had. And I guarantee you, you know, he says he loves all his teams the same. There's no doubt in my mind that he loves this team more than ever. I, I can just, I get that feel anytime I, I see Saban in his post game pressers and even off the cuff in some of his remarks. Talk with Peter Burns from the SEC Network and Sirius XM as well. So you, you had Doring today, huh? Yeah, unfortunately, I was stuck with uh, Doring. I mean, I hadn't seen him in about in, in a week and a half or so because we were we were traveling, doing some different shows, and um, it was. I mean, just again, so much to to download from Sark leaving to how good the SEC did in their bowl games compared to like the ACC, who I think went like four and thirteen the last couple years. So um, there was there was a lot to chew on um, uh, uh, this morning, and. And that's, that's a great part about it. It's like the fact that we're still talking college football when we didn't know if we'd be having any of it back in mid-August. Thank, thank goodness uh, Greg Sankey in, uh, in, in the league office didn't listen to, to uh, the Big Ten or anything like that, or else uh, we, I don't know what we'd be talking about today. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, it is a miracle in a way. I mean, not only that, but we just, we just finished an NFL complete season, which I don't think anybody thought would happen. And, and we'll see where it goes from here. Uh, hey, you got to talk me out of or into doing this, okay? Yeah. I'm an AP voter. I think this will be my last year doing it because I left the newspaper, obviously. But they let me do it through the end of the year. If Alabama beats Ohio State, my preliminary poll, I've got A&M number two. Wow. I mean, so think about that. Who else would you put? You're not going to put Clemson in there after they got blown out. You're not going to put Notre Dame in there. Ohio State, frankly, I think it came together, but I, I got to see what they look like. I'm not sure. And then Cincinnati lost to Georgia. I mean, once you start playing the the, yeah. the elimination game of who the second best team in the country is, hard to say that it would not be A&M, right? I mean, you know, they, they what, won, win 10 games um, and have nine, nine games in this SEC, and I, they probably would have beat Ole Miss as well too. I, it's crazy to think. But I could see that. And, and the, here's my theory that I said this morning. The best thing to ever happened, Pat, to A&M was them not being in the college football playoff. Yeah. And the reason why I say that is that I don't, I don't think they would have beat Alabama again. They might have kept it a little bit closer, but they did about the same job that Notre Dame would end up doing, I think. They probably would have lost by 17 or so. And so now, you know, Jimbo Fisher can use that same recruiting pitch going, hey, why don't you come back one more year to all that great offensive line or maybe even Kellen Mond. Hey, let's go finish this because we're right on the cusp of greatness. Um, that, that's probably the best thing to happen to Jimbo. Now, he'll never admit that, but I'll, uh, I'll be happy to say it for him. No, he would never admit that. He had good wheels, though, getting away from that water. Him, him and Kirby, too. Um, Kirby, Kirby was going out there. And how about that, huh? I mean, Kirby... Um, you know, uh, Pod Lesney or whatever hitting the 53 yard field goal to beat Cincinnati. And thank goodness he didn't because you imagine the amount of, you know, game management talk that we would be having about Kirby yep. Smart, the way they mismanaged the end of that game um, had, had that field goal not gone in. So um, it bowl season worked pretty well for a bunch of SEC squads this year. It did. And you worked well for us. We appreciate you being on, thank Peter. You. And uh, thanks so much. And we'll talk to you soon down the road. And I always look forward to to being on the show with you and uh, Chris and uh, sometimes Jacob Hester and all, all kinds of guys.
Yeah, I'm, de I'm definitely the least talented on uh, on Sirius XM Radio. There's no doubt about it. So, Pat, we appreciate it, bud. We'll holler at you soon. All right, see you, Peter. Peter yeah, Burns from the SEC Network and Sirius XM Radio. And, uh, you know, he what he said was I, – I, I've said for a long time, and this is what I, I say about the Gators. Look, when, you, when you're a Florida basketball player, they're, the team that's playing against you is not playing against you. They're playing against the you know, 04s. When you're a Florida football player, they're playing against Tebow. I mean, Florida has built up this great brand, but part of being a great brand is that teams are going to come after you. They want to beat you so badly. It matters so much to them. And that's the deal with, uh, I mean, it's the same deal with Alabama, but they just are good enough and they're well enough coached. Uh, Saban does an amazing job. I, I, I have a lo so much respect for him. I used to not like him. Um, because he was so mean to the media. But uh, I, I've kind of learned to understand what his, the methods of his madness. And the more I hear about him, and again, talking to other coaches and, and people that are around him, and just the way he does things and the, the attention to detail, I think there's a lot of coaches that could take lessons from him. Just going and getting one of his assistants is not the answer all the time. Now, it has been... You could say for Kirby Smart for Georgia, certainly hadn't been with Jeremy Pruitt, one with Jim McElwain, one with Will Muschamp. Well, he had a little bit of time with, with uh, Nick. Um, and and uh, it'll be interesting to see if Will Muschamp ends up back at LSU as a defensive coordinator, which I've heard. I don't know. Um, so there's different coaches where it works. So that's the only thing I'm talking about with Sarkeesian. Don't fall in love with their offense, okay? Their offense is what it is because of their players. You know, anybody can call deep post to uh, Devontae Smith and, and be happy with it. By the way, and we'll get to some of the, there's a lot of news we want to get to. In fact, um, really sad to hear about Doc Holl Holliday getting let go today by Marshall. Nobody's getting fired this year, right? And apparently the, this goes all the way up to the governor who did, made this decision. So... People, more people, there are more cooks, there's no doubt about it. I want to let you know about our Leonard's, Leonardo's, sorry, at Mill, Millhopper uh, Quick Picks Contest. We have new qualifiers from the two that we did last week. My friend Tom Doran qualified. I'm glad to see that. Uh, JP, JP, you need to give me name instead of initials. I'm not going with initials anymore. Uh, Dwayne Searle, uh, Tim McDaniel for the second time qualified, and Ben Lamford. They all qualified. In fact, some of these guys went perfect on the picks. And I'm like, go to Vegas, man. So we'll have another one for you on Friday as well. And we'll be right back in just a minute or so with uh, so or Sue. Sue with uh, the great Patrick Young here on another Duly Noted Podcast. Thanks so much to our title sponsors, ABC Fine Wine and Spirits and Titan MRI. And to our pick sponsor, Leonardo's of Millhopper. You can find us live on Facebook and YouTube or listen at your leisure on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or wherever you find all your favorite podcasts. I'm excited to continue this podcast and to have your company on board as a sponsor. If you're interested in being part of the show, email me at patrickdooley54 at gmail.com or give me a call, 352-317-3444. Titan MRI, North Central Florida's premier independent diagnostic testing MRI facility. At Titan MRI, we're focused on you, the patient, having a great customer experience. Our MRI equipment is modern and 75% quieter than any unit in its class. And our MRI unit has one of the largest openings of any of the newer high strength MRI units, which allows comfortable scanning for potential claustrophobic and larger patients. At Titan MRI, we look forward to serving you. All right, welcome back to another Duly Noted Podcast. It's a great pleasure to bring on uh, a good friend of mine who does a great job now with doing his own podcast. And uh, I think he will be the next guy we see taking over the airwaves uh, now that he's back from Greece. Uh, Patrick Young joining us right now. Patrick, how are you today? Who, who are you talking to? Uh, <laughs> friend, I didn't know. I, I didn't know we were friends. Who are you talking about? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Man. I'm doing I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's great to see you, my guy. 
Well, I met your friends with my wife. You, you and her are really good friends, and you and Kelsey are good friends, but not maybe not so much me. But at any rate, now look, you just got back from Greece. I, the video of you uh, surprising, was that your grandparents and your dad? My grandparents uh, surprised them. I had, I had to get my sister to help me. Um, my original plan was to surprise everyone on New Year's Eve because they were going to be together for a, a little family crab royal slash celebrating my dad's 60, 63rd birthday, uh, but they changed their plans. So then I'm like, gosh, now I have to tell my sister that I'm here. And then, <laughs> But it was, it was great. Uh, she helped me set everybody up. There was a really good one of my mom as well, but she was in her pajamas, and she's like, I don't want to be on social media. Uh, so, so uh, uh, you know, one video that it, that's not going to get put out on, on out there. <laughs> well, I can understand that. Um, hey, um, so over there, you, you were basically on lockdown yourself. I know you were hurt, and you couldn't get into any gyms. I mean, tell us a little bit about what, what, what happened over there. So which, where do you want to start with, Israel first or Greece? Because I got a chance yeah. to go to both. Okay, so uh, I left August 18th to go to Israel, 17th, and got to Israel the 18th. Subsequently, when I was there, I, I tested positive with COVID. So I pretty much got COVID as soon as I get into Israel, and I had to, to quarantine for 21 days. And uh, within that, that time I was there, Israel implemented a lockdown, like a, a serious lockdown, where uh, really you could only go to the doctor if you need, maybe need to get to do a test or for any other type of medical thing, um, and the grocery store. And you you're, you were only allowed to go to the grocery store that's nearest to you. If you don't, there's a chance you get a, he a hefty fine. So, uh, you know, while I was in, in my lockdown, I had a nice balcony at least, so I had, had a lot of time to sit outside and reflect, and my team. Uh, was bringing me food every day, um, and they brought me a spin bike. Whenever they're bringing me food, I would like I would talk to the the whoever was delivering it. I'm like, hey, don't go yet. This is let's just have a conversation. We can talk through the window. We can we can talk through the window. You know, just how how are you doing, man? <laughs> uh, so I ended up I get I got released from that team a little bit later because the lockdown did end up um, uh, postponing the season. Um, and I, I was on a non-guaranteed contract at the time. And even though I had a great time there with my teammates, with the, the coaches, the general manager, the owner made a, the decision that he wanted to let me go. So I went over to, to Greece. It seemed like the, the wisest thing to do to stay in Europe, to stay available for another team to pick me up. If you're, if you're closer there, it's easier to, to grab you for a tryout or whatever it may be. But within about a week or so of being in Greece, they implemented a, a serious lockdown as well. Uh, a 9 p.m. curfew. All restaurants, all retail shopping is closed. Only delivery. And also you had to send a text message to the government between that uh, 5, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. of what you were going to do. There was a, a 1 through 6 number corresponding to uh, something like going to the grocery store, going to the doctor, going for a walk. And, uh, yeah, that was life for about 70-so days in Greece. That was it. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, were you afraid that they weren't going to let you out to get back home? No, I was never afraid of not getting let out. Uh, no, no, that, that wasn't a fear. I, I just I – just, uh, and it was time for me after being there for so long. I, I, I knew I missed my family so much. I couldn't wait to come home and see your face again. I couldn't wait. Yeah. What, uh, so what do you think? Are you uh, going to try it again? Are you going to keep trying? Are you, are you going to go to the, the other way, which is you've done so well at? You know, it's something I'm still meditating on. Uh, something that we all need to know in life is our why and what we truly value. And this, this quarantine, this, this past year, really exposed a lot of things that I thought I valued and I thought I uh like basketball, even though basketball is something I, I've done a lot of and played a lot of, it's not who I am. Uh, it's something I do and something I enjoy to do. And it ends for everybody at some point. It ends for everybody that, that plays on a, either high school, even before that. And we all wanted to end on, on our own terms. Do I believe that I can still go out there and make it happen? Yes. But is that the most valuable thing to me right now? Ah. Great opportunities with the SEC network possibly coming up, which I'm, I really would love to have that. That that'd be a career job for me, 
um, and being able to stay around basketball, stay around the game, to travel. You know, we're, we're, we're waiting to see. You know, my heart is open right now uh, to see what the possibilities hold. I've let go of expectations, and I'm taking it one day at a time and just going to continue to strive to be the, the same person I am every day. Did you ever come close to going going ahead and playing football when you're here at Florida? I mean, I know you did that video where you caught a bunch of balls. Uh, you know, I, I if if who was the coach at the time? Uh, Muschamp. If if Muschamp would have came to me personally, I probably would have really thought about it, and really considered it. But my my dad, he played football for uh, the Jacksonville Bulls back in the day, and. He, you know, concussions, shoulder separations, uh, all all the types of things that you go through. He he just didn't want me to play football. So I wish I I wish I would have at least got a chance to play like uh, Pee Wee football or Pop Warner, just so I could have gotten that itch out. Because I have no idea. I played in the street with my friends all the time, and mm-hmm. I thought I was pretty good. I I was pretty, but you know, never 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 got the opportunity. And it's funny, after I graduated uh, from UF. Uh, Coach Pelfrey, John Pelfrey, uh, he was on the phone. He's on the conversation. I, I don't remember where we were, we were exactly. And I overhear him talking because the conversation was about me. And, and uh, he's like, no, he's not interested. He, he loves to play basketball. And I, he hangs up the phone. I'm like, everything all right, Coach? He was like, uh, yeah, that was a, someone with the Seahawks. They want to see if you're interested in, in, in trying out to, for, to do a combine pretty much. And I was like, Wow. That's that's pretty cool that uh people are actually keeping an eye out for basketball players like that that could possibly transition. But now I'm happy with the path I took. Does your dad know that I covered the Jacksonville Bulls when I was at the Times Union up in Jacksonville? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think he knows that. Yeah, he needs to. I mean, I'm sure I've interviewed him at some point, but uh, obviously, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. It was the best two years of my life. I had a great time doing that. Still, but I still got a jersey. Still got his jersey. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about what was probably the best year of your life, or at least uh, that season when you guys won 30 in a row. Um, That kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, we knew you guys were going to be pretty good, but I don't think anybody expected anything like that to win 30 in a row and get all the way to the Final Four. Yeah, we we didn't necessarily write down any goals like that because – you know Coach Donovan better than I do. He, it's about the process. It's about staying in the moment and building every single day. I remember when the season started because we had just lost to a really, a really hot Michigan team in in the Elite Eight, and but we had a, one of the best defenses uh, for points per possession going um, that last season. And we come into this next season, the senior year, we, you know, got that chip on our shoulder. We're the guys. This is our team. Me, Scotty, Will, and Casey, and we kind of relaxed to to begin the season when it came to that every day putting your hard hat on. And I don't remember what preseason game it was we played. Um, and Coach Donovan was like, "It doesn't matter what you guys did before. It doesn't matter what they're saying. It doesn't matter if you need to lay the foundation brick by brick every single day, like doing shell drill, doing the shell." shell drill defensively every single day that we, we were just like, why are we doing this? But we, we can't came able to embrace it. We we loved just sharing uh, this is the, the experiences with each other, each other, seeing each other grow. I got to tell you, watching Casey Prather, his transformation from his first three years to his final his last year was, was incredible for me um, because I know he was struggling so much because he, he couldn't figure out his role. Um, but we, you know, we didn't really think about going undefeated and all that stuff until we were like maybe a few games away from doing something no one else did. And the fact that we went like 100 and, 105 days without losing a game, yeah, that was for by far the best basketball uh, period in my life. Yeah, obviously that, that Kentucky game at the SEC tournament was one that has stayed with me forever. Scotty diving on the ball, on the ball just to oh, yeah. end it. That was an incredible uh, battle there. And then the other one was uh, obviously the uh, when when uh, Dayton had all those fans there in Memphis. Oh yeah. I mean it was oh, packed yeah. with Dayton people. We went on the streets after we got double the stories after the the uh, Sweet Sixteen, and we're like, 
Where did all these people come from? They were they had taken over the city. I mean, they they we I felt I felt honestly that was one of the first games like going into that final four that we were or going into that Elite Eight game, I knew we were gonna win that game. I not to say that Dayton didn't have a chance, but just that we were we were so seasoned. Like it it, it, it it didn't matter what they brought because we were in the SEC. We had we played in Kentucky, we played in Missouri, where the fans are insane. Tennessee, like it was nothing to us. It, it, we weren't deterred. We were composed, uh, and it was our time. It was our time to make it happen. I remember there was a one one play where the you guys shot and missed. There was ball went down. They shot and missed. You shot me. You guys were running back and up and down the floor, and finally Scotty got the ball and went. Everybody, calm down. Calm down. Yeah, I mean, because it was it, you wanted to get there so bad just to finally get past that elite eight because three years in a row had not been able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was tough to to go through those, be so close. I, I literally watched the the highlights. I watched the whole game actually when we played uh, uh, BYU, BYU yeah. right before we played went, ended up ended up playing Butler. And just watching us uh, back at those times in the tournaments, uh, it was awesome. Uh, we we can look at look at it and say you know fell short, fell short here and there. But look at a guy like Tim Kelly with the Buffalo Bills, and and what they accomplished. You know, going to was it four straight Super Bowls in a row, and they didn't win a single one. Still, the experience you can't take away. How many guys went through college and, and never made the tournament, or they made it once and. Of course, as, as Gator fans, as, as competitors, we wanted to be great and want to do our best. But, you know, those hurdles, those, the, the adversity, because nothing's guaranteed, it, it, it helped us get better. I think better as men, better as basketball players. Uh, it forced us to look inside of ourselves to say, like, hey, what can we do personally to not let this happen again? Or even the perspective of, of you know, at the end of the day, it's a basketball game. You know, uh, I have so much more in my life that I can't allow this thing to dictate my happiness uh, because it's in, it's, it's in the past. You got to move on. Life keeps going on. You, you lose a game, you get up, you keep moving. You win a game, you keep you get up, you keep moving. Like, and uh, that's it. That's what I love so much about sports is that there are so many life lessons that if your eyes are open and your heart's open, you can correlate it directly to your life and. Uh, Basketball has been done such a fantastic job in my experience, especially at the University of Florida, uh, to be the man that I am today. I know you, you like to play golf every once in a while. Have you been able to play any? It's hilarious you say that. I'm heading right now. Do you know Jim Loudon by chance? Yeah. Yeah, I'm heading up to his, his, his spot right now to get a new uh, a new club. I'm, uh, I've already played uh, at Brentwood. My dad is actually a coach. He is certified. My dad is official. He he uh, got his um, certification. I can't remember N N R G I F certified pro something like that. I can't remember it. Wow. But uh, we're really excited that uh, he's gonna coach me up. I'm gonna kick your butt really bad, Bring it. and I'm gonna take all your, <laughs> and I'm gonna take all your money, and I'm not gonna feel <laughs> bad about it. And then I'm going to spend your money and buy you a beer. <laughs> and then and then you can bring your bass out because you now you you started to learn how to play the bass and we'll jam. It'll be a great day. Sounds like a great day. Yep. As long as your your brother's got to be there as well, then it's, then it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. It, there's the story with my brother and and Patrick is ridiculous because somebody had a little too much to drink and it wasn't Patrick. Let me let me put it that way. But uh, it was fun. Uh, hey, look, we appreciate you coming on. And go ahead and plug your, your podcast. Oh, yeah. It's the, the Young and the Rowdies, uh, Florida Gator basketball podcast. Check it out on Apple and Spotify. Just connecting with everyone that's had anything to do with Florida basketball through the years. Reminiscing on the past, talking about the present, bringing up some stories that I've never heard of and <laughs> getting their perspective. And, uh, yeah, just talking about – how, how awesome it is to be a part of Gator Nation. Patrick, from one Patrick to another, I appreciate it, and thanks for coming on, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. See you soon, my man. Thank you. Have a good one. All right, Patrick Young joining us here, and we appreciate his time so much. If you want to get a question in, um, uh, the number is 352-780-0720.
Uh, we did get a Facebook Live question in who will win, Alabama or Ohio State? And I will tell you that I had to make my pick because somehow when we had Drew Copeland on last week, we tied for first place. And so we have to uh, decide, make this a decider. We didn't pick the Alabama Ohio State game. I let, let him have first choice. He took Alabama. I'm taking Ohio State. So now I know I've got to root for. I'm rooting for Ohio State. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We still have to do three things and uh, finish up this show. We appreciate everybody clicking on another duly noted podcast. Thank you so much for uh, either watching or listening. And uh, again, thanks to Leonardo's at Millhopper for the quick picks. We'll have another contest on Friday. We're going to give you guys so many chances, but I got an announcement to make about it as soon as we come back from this break. Thanks so much to our title sponsors, ABC Fine Wine and Spirits and Titan MRI, and to our pick sponsor, Leonardo's of Millhopper. You can find us live on Facebook and YouTube or listen at your leisure on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or wherever you find all your favorite podcasts. I'm excited to continue this podcast and to have your company on board as a sponsor. If you're interested in being part of the show, email me at patrickdooley54 at gmail.com or give me a call, 352-317-3444. Titan MRI, North Central Florida's premier independent diagnostic testing MRI facility. At Titan MRI, we're focused on you, the patient, having a great customer experience. Our MRI equipment is modern and 75% quieter than any unit in its class. And our MRI unit has one of the largest openings of any of the newer high-strength MRI units, which allows comfortable scanning for potential claustrophobic and larger patients. At Titan MRI, we look forward to serving you. All right, we have uh, gotten a lot of questions coming in, but we got to kind of crank things up. Uh, one, one question we got in on the, uh, the text line, and again, we, we, if anybody wants to be involved in sponsoring that, because... We'll continue to get those in. Will Urban Meyer lead the Jags this year? And that's the big question. Um, I think it, it might happen. I, it's, it's, it's a weird fit, though, to me. But you know how Urban gets anxious about things. He gets anxious about being able to um, coach, and he misses the coaching. I don't, there's no doubt in my mind. And the idea of doing it in the state of Florida, where he has ties, obviously. I mean, you're not having to recruit, and you can do it without recruiting and just coaching, and might be kind of like what Billy did. Billy got out of it here because he was tired of the recruiting. He was tired. He knew the cheating that was going on or around him, and he wanted just to worry about basketball. And that's that maybe that's what Urban will do as well. If you want to get in uh, a call on our text line three five two three seven eight. I'm sorry, seven eight zero. 0720-352-780-0720, and uh, we'll, we'll answer those questions. By the way, the announcement I had on the uh, Leonardo's at Millhopper Quick Picks Contest, you know, we gave you the qualifiers who qualified in the, uh, over the last two weeks in our contest. We're going to have another contest Friday, which will involve the NFL, and then we'll have another one on Monday. And then that will involve just the national championship game. And then that's going to stop it for what we're going to give away. We've got all these prizes to give away. I'm going to give them away, and we'll start another one, a brand new set of qualifiers. So if you get in as a qualifier, if you get in, we have several people that have done it twice, so they will have two names in the hat. And we're going to do it live right here on Friday of next week, not this week, not Friday, the next Friday. Uh, also, don't forget, tomorrow night, the Heisman Trophy will be announced. And um, it's kind of a weird deal. It's going to be done virtually and late, much later than it normally is, but still before the bowl game. So people can say, wow, well, he, he screwed up because he was a Heisman winner, which I never thought was true anyway. Um, Danny Werfel seemed to do pretty good with it. Uh, and I think Mac Jones will do fine if he wins it. And Devontae Smith, if he wins it. Will Kyle Trask, does he have any chance? You know, don't forget... The voting took place right after the Alabama game for most people, other than the lazy voters who sometimes vote as soon as they get their ballots in. They didn't get a chance to vote early this year because the ballots came in, and then five days later, you had to have them in, and the, and the championship game was played. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, 
where Kyle finishes. I don't think he'll win. Um, stranger things have happened. And to me, if Kyle Trask won, you know what it would be? Revenge for Rex Grossman. Think about that. that that's what I'll call it. All right. Uh, I haven't even mentioned Gator basketball. I want to mention them. I know we're running out of time, but um, Gator basketball, I went to the game, so I'm off the hook on being the jinx. Uh, went to the game on uh, Saturday and uh, appreciate my friend Brian Kornblau for uh, setting us up with tickets there. Um, they, they are unbelievable seats. I couldn't ask for better seats. And uh, we, had, we had the whole deal, you know, where you go back and get food and everything. That was great. Had some pork and some hot dog at halftime. Um, oh, but, but the Gator game. Oh, yeah, the basketball game, yeah. Um, that gritty, gutty effort. Give those guys a lot of credit. I tell you, what they were able to do to, to get up to a lead, hang on to the lead. It got a little dicey at the end with a couple steals. But this team's uh, doing, doing well, doing, uh, considering what they're dealing with. I mean, remember that Mike White said that, look, when we come back, we're not going to be in SEC shape. We, it could be a struggle. And what happens? They win their first two SEC games, one of them against a pretty good LSU team. Now, next up, they get Alabama, which is coming off the big win over Tennessee, and then Kentucky. Now, this will blow your mind. You ready for this? Florida right now is number 22 in the country according to the net rankings. The net rankings are the new RPI, as, we, as many of you know, because we dealt with that last year and the year before that as well. So this has been in, in place for a while. So 22nd in the net rankings, which is very good. Very good. Alabama's 36. So if you can win at Alabama, that's, that's pretty big. You know where Kentucky is? Of course, we all know they've been off to a, they were struggling. They did win in double overtime on Saturday. Kentucky's number 144. Losing to Kentucky is like the worst thing any team can do for their net ranking. But um, it, it has been great to see these guys play and do what they've been able to do. Uh, and I don't think anybody's going to be mad or angry. Although, Cater Nation, you never know if they don't do well this week. But this is going to be a tough week for them. Because Kentucky has got good players. We all know that. They always have good players. They just can't find a way to play together until March. And so it may be even tougher for them this year. So maybe one of those years, look, they're going to have to win a lot of games. They, they almost will have to win the tournament to get into the tournament. In other words, the SEC tournament, which you get an automatic bid for, and who knows if it'll even be playing that. You don't know what's, what's going to happen. All right, before we get out of here, we've got to get to three things. Three things we appreciate uh, everybody who likes three things, but we, we still are looking for a sponsor. If you want to get involved as a sponsor on that, uh, we've got a couple of people who may be interested in it, we, so we'll find out in the next few days, hopefully, about that. But, uh, again, we've got some sponsorships open for you. I hope... People are enjoying this podcast. I've gotten nothing but positive reviews back. Oh, I've got a couple of negative ones, and I straighten those people out. All right, three things. Number one, you know, if Kyle Trask doesn't win the Heisman, which I'm assuming he will not, he could. It's not out of the realm of possibility. But if he does not, he also will not make All-American, which means he doesn't get a brick out in front of there. It feels like there's got to be some way to honor the most prolific passer in the history of Florida football. That's what he is. Over 4,000 yards, 43 touchdown passes. I mean, he has done it better than anybody else in a, in a SEC-only pandemic year. But there's almost no way to honor him because of all the restrictions you have. Okay, you've got to be an All-American to get a, a, a paver, to get one of those bricks, which Kyle Pitts did and, and will have one. You, uh, to get the Ring of Honor is almost impossible, and I'm not a big fan of the Ring of Honor. I've said it a million times, and I can talk about it till I'm blue in the face of what I would do differently about the Ring of Honor, or even come up with another way. Maybe there's another way to do it, where people like Carlos Alvarez, who I believe should be honored with his name in that stadium. You know, right now you've got the guys who are in the Ring of Honor. There's only, what, six of them. And then you've got Spurrier, twice, which he deserves, every bit of it. He should be up there ten times. But it feels like maybe there's a way to take people like Percy Harvin and Kyle Trask and Carlos Alvarez, people like that that deserve to be honored in some way there. 
Now I know that outside they do have those uh, banners for guys that were did great things, but I, I think sometimes people don't even see them. They're right way up there in the air. You got to look for them. You know, it's just like with the trophies for um, for a lot of the championships that Florida's won around here. There, you have to be in their facility and you know in the right place to be able to see them. Um, but you know. That's another whole nother topic I don't even want to get into. All right, number two, um, I cannot wait to see what the punishment that Mississippi State gets for the brawl they had with Tulsa, and that Tulsa will get too. But look, let's face it, the conferences are going to decide. Now, they may have announced something later today, or they may announce something that, while I'm on the air here, but um, it should be pretty severe. I mean, I, look, I don't know that there is a penalty you can get that's too severe. Um, I, you know, without getting into details, it was the, one of the worst brawls I've ever seen. It reminded me a little bit, if you remember, the last game that Lou Holtz coached at so South Carolina was against Clemson, and they had this massive brawl, and it was the same physicality to it. It was, it was, it was hard to watch, and they decided not to play in their bowl game. Holtz had already stepped down. Here comes Steve Spurrier. He's got to inherit this mess, and all he does is win, win a bunch of games there. Uh, I'm curious what it's going to be, how, how hard they're going to come down on players. But, you know, I don't think they're going to come down on Mike Leach because afterwards he said, well, I told these guys not to do that again. <laughs> He's unbelievable. Anyway, it should be very severe. And number three, um, uh, Sunday night football, the Eagles tanked, um, brought in a, their third-team quarterback because – they're saying they were trying to win the game. Nobody believes them for a second. They, they were better off losing. It would help their draft status. And it would, you know, kind of stick it to the Giants, too. I, you know, but what are you going to do? If it was, if it was a, something that would help you as a team, look, if Jacksonville had purposely tanked to get to 1 and 15, which they didn't, it's hard to go 1 and 15, though, without tanking. Would that not have helped them? Yes, it would help their program. You gotta understand everybody's always gotta do what's best for them, for their program. Because it's a very selfish world we live in. Do what's best for you. Because nobody else is gonna help you out. Unless, you know, the the, uh, the they help you out the way they did last night by tanking. So but for the most part, you've got to do it your way. You've got to continue your way to do things that are best for you. It's what it's all about. All right. Wow. Long show today, but that's fine. We love it, and we hope you guys are enjoying it. Again, if you want to reach me to be involved as a sponsor, 352-317-3444. I'm, I'm available almost all the time, most of the time. Uh, so we appreciate our, our great guests, Peter Burns and Patrick Young, for joining us today. On Friday, we come back to you with another show. Scott Strickland's going to join us. And uh, Kevin Carter, the great one. Um, he was, what an unbelievable player he was. He's going to join us as well. And we're going to continue this going. We appreciate everybody for uh, watching, if you were watching now, or for listening later. We appreciate that as well. Until next time, again, thanks to our main sponsors, ABC Fine Wine and Liquors, Titan MRI. We do appreciate, uh, of course, Leonard's at Leonardo's, I've said that twice, Leonardo's at Millhopper uh, for the quick picks. We'll do that again Friday. I know you can't wait for that. Until next time, I'm Pat Dooley. I am deep, I'm way back, and I am out of here.